Prime Time Local News, serving the Lakeland and Midwest regions. Hello and welcome to Prime Time Local News. I'm Callan Dunlop. Thank you for joining us. 2024 is the first year since 2011 that Saskatchewan teachers have gone on strike. With the provincial government not budging and teachers becoming more antsy, the situation could lead to more missed school for students. Our Ben Lawan has more. Lloyd Minster teachers braved the cold weather as they participated in the second day of province-wide walkouts. They walked with signs and waved at passing vehicles showing their support. Teachers are looking to reduce class sizes and increase the support for classroom complexities they see, like learning issues and mental health challenges. But according to Derek Armstrong, the government is not willing to discuss those proposals. The, the government has walked away from the table. Uh, the government is only willing to talk about one of the proposals that we brought forward, and that, that proposal is salary. Uh, the other proposals uh, take front or state, fr uh, center stage at this point, and uh, teachers are willing to kind of let the salary negotiation uh, happen at the end of the, the contract negotiations. The class sizes and complexities provincial schools are facing have big effects on both teachers and students. You know, we're at class sizes that are 34 plus and we're seeing um, more and more students who need the support in the classroom and they just don't have it. You know, you have some of these students who don't have that support and maybe they are falling through the cracks and it's not fair. The teachers don't have so many people to pay attention to, so then you can't learn as much. No matter the person, everyone participating is here for the same reason. This is for students and teachers and learning in our community um, and this is this is important. If we don't do this now, when are we going to do this? It's for the students and if we fund education and support our students, we'll have a strong future here in Saskatchewan. If a deal is not made soon between the Saskatchewan Teachers Federation and the provincial government, strikes like these could happen more often and with less notice. For Primetime Local News, I'm Ben Lowan. The Lloydminster Gun and Outdoor Sportsman Show was hosted this past weekend, giving an opportunity for people to buy local guns and outdoor gear. The Service Sports Centre was buzzing Sunday as they hosted the 2024 Lloydminster Gun and Outdoor Sportsman Show. Vendors were able to come in and sell their products to buyers as well as network with others in the community. This year's show is one of the biggest to date and organizer Janelle Misko is happy with the turnout yesterday which was great the lineup when we opened up was phenomenal so it's good to see that such a turnout this year with the event being so successful misco says this can help grow the other gun shows around the country I see a lot of flyers taped to all of the walls around here so there's all the other upcoming gun shows so they're all usually planned throughout the year so you'll see vegaville's uh coming up provost is coming up and there's a couple of different signs letting you know where and when for more information about the industry, it can be found on their website. A local dealership is celebrating for 35 years of service, so they're taking the next two weeks to honor their customers. Barry Mackican, who, is, who has been working in Denham Chrysler for 10 years, gives us some key points that made them reach this key milestone. First names, we're there to serve them. They know they can reach us on our cell phones. And I think that kind of service might be something that sets us apart or, again, has really helped our longevity in the community. Tell the truth, do good business, uh, you know, be a responsible member of the community, uh, you know, and, and keep solving problems for people. Mackie tells us how they are going to be celebrating the dealership's 35 years of service. Yeah, no, we're, we're celebrating kind of throughout the year. Just We're just going to make some great deals. We're going to, you know, talk with our customers. We're going to, I'm sure we'll have cake at some point. Yeah. <laughs> the event started on last week and it will end on Saturday, February 3rd at the Lloyd Exhibition Grounds. It's now time for our weekly edition of Retrospect. Here is our Callum Hawker. We start our week in retrospect in 1995 as the Mar Wayne School get broadcasting equipment through a government grant. Since October, a Midwest school has been resembling a video production house as Marwayne students are working with visual communication equipment. Uh, we use mostly Super VHS. Both of our newest cameras are Super VHS. 
Um, basically, we use Super VHS as much as we can and hand in our final projects onto VHS. The $65,000 worth of equipment is thanks to a provincial yeah. government grant, a grant school officials use to enhance career and technology yeah. studies. The government has reorganized the practical arts. It encompasses uh, home ec, industrial arts, and business ed. Uh, visual communications, of course, is part of the practical arts. That's where these dollars were applied to this application. I can get a complete base if I want. With a 16-channel audio board, two pre-editing stations and computer editing at their fingertips, students are receiving a head start into the future. Uh, basically, anybody who hasn't seen this stuff goes into college. You're behind the eight ball already. You're not going to have the opportunities that you've had. You don't have the education. You don't have the experience using the equipment. So you're going to have a hard time. Teachers are also seeing the benefits of the high-tech equipment. Well, I'm teaching Macbeth right now. And in Macbeth, our students, not only do they study Macbeth, but they do drama because that's what Shakespeare is, is drama. And we video it and we put it together. And then they have a video of them doing uh, Macbeth, which is a good feedback for them. And it's a good production and it's, it's interesting for them to do and they enjoy it. And it just adds another dimension to the course. In three short months, the students have become so competent, their work is going to be used in the business community. Chamber of Commerce gave us an opportunity where we can go through the town um, taking shots of the, the businesses that are here, the facilities that we have, putting them into a video, possibly using music background into them, make our town look appealing to people who may want to move here, broadcast it over cable channels around our region, maybe other regions too, get in, people interested in our agriculture around here. And in 1999, we take a look back at Lakeland Regional Health as they face a budget deficit. It was a packed but orderly house as citizen after citizen representing group after group made their opinions heard. They're concerned about money, the lack thereof, and what it might mean for health care in the Elk Point region of the Lakeland Health Authority. I feel that uh, a lot of the budget deficit comes from the higher-ups, uh, not the local uh, working people, we should keep our front line workers. Um, as far as the possibility of closing our hospital, I'm not in favor of that because we have such a large area. To deal with the issue, Alberta Health has hired a consulting firm, which has stressed that no decisions have been made. They are touring the region to gather input from citizens on the matter. We've been hired to review the governance and management practices of the Lakeland Regional Health Authority. We've also been asked to review the uh, a deficit that the Lakeland region is facing and to provide some advice on how best to tackle the deficit. With a large elderly population and agricultural and oil field activity in the area, people are concerned that rumored cuts will make them second class to their urban cousins. Well, we're hopeful that uh, there will be some funding increases uh, uh, to us. Uh, whether it will be sufficient enough or not, I don't know. The Premier has uh, indicated that uh, he wants to hold uh, spending uh, on departments to 3%. People here are concerned that the government is looking at the matter as a cost-effective issue and not a funding one, which is currently pegged at $92 million a year for the region. There's also a question with regard to uh, access for the elderly. There's a question with regard to access to quality medical care. So those are all major issues that are under, uh, under review. And that's all we have for this week in Retrospect. Retrospect is brought to you by Webb's Machinery. Find New Holland products at Webb's Machinery, your dealer in Vermilion, Vegreville, Lamont, Wainwright, St. Paul, and Consulate. And we'll have more primetime local news after the break. The MD of Bonneville Council has approved a development application for a new brewery. Abby St. John has more on the Net Zero Nano Brewery coming to a farm located near Bonneville. I'm happy to be joined here today by Rena Theis, owner of 350 Farms near Bonneville. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Abby. Of course. Now, the MD of Bonneville Council recently approved a development application for a net zero nano brewery at your farm, which is very exciting. Can you tell me about the brewery and what people should know about it? So the idea is basically to brew traditional uh, Belgian beers that are inspired by the Trappist tradition. So Trappists are a type of monks uh, in Belgium that as part of their monastic life, they make beer. Uh, it's an old, old tradition back to the times of Charlemagne, uh, 
uh, I was really interested uh, in it. I'm from I'm from Belgium originally, and I actually studied uh, at one of the universities where those monks, their brewmasters, uh, go to learn how to brew their beers. Um, so what I would like to do is uh, bring that to uh, the region, the area, experiment a little bit with uh, with recipes, and kind of have my own take to to tradition. Um, the other element uh, of it is the net zero part. Um, and the idea there is to use um, electric brewing equipment as opposed to natural gas uh, and have those hooked up uh, onto a grid tied uh, solar array. Uh, so that when you need to pull more power to brew your beer, you can pull it from the grid, but the rest of the time the solar array basically compensates for whatever electricity you've been using. With the brewing process being net zero instead of using natural gas, does that affect the taste of the beer or how does the process of it work? So that's a good question. Like uh, taste wise, it doesn't really change anything. The equipment is a little bit different uh, in the sense that it works a lot more by preheating uh, a lot of the water because beer is basically it's, it's, it's a ton of water, right? You use hundreds of liters of water to, to, to brew beer. Um, so uh, that would be the main difference as far as technique is concerned. Uh, the, um, the, the other things are exactly the same because we're using the same temperatures, same processes and everything. Um, the, the important part is it's a nano production. Uh, that's what's envisioned right now. Uh, the goal is to produce small amounts, um, think about a thousand beers uh, per brew day. Uh, which is very very small when you when you think brewing um just to see how the equipment handles uh, and then have the option to scale it up later on um there are very large uh, electrical brewing systems uh, heineken for example is, is transitioning to a net zero brewing uh but those are like industrial sized right um so for me it's more of a kind of like a scientific experiment seeing how we can do it uh how much um, how much production is impacted, um, and try to get a feel of how things work um, to maybe scale up later. Now, I know you're still in the early stages of the brewery, but can you tell me more about 350 Farms and when people can expect the brewery to be open? So now that we have development permit, uh, the first thing we're going to do, we're going to really look into the, the, the details of like the technical feasibility uh, of the project and like how many solar arrays we need and then so on and so forth. Uh, so that's going to be the first phase and we need to convert part of our uh, existing building. Uh, that's kind of right now, it's our commercial kitchen and kind of our base of operation for the farm. Um, so that needs to be modified. Um, and then we probably need to do a few tests. <laughs> so I think it, we're, we're looking at a year to a year and a half probably before the first commercial uh products are, are uh, come out of the of the uh, of the brewery um the farm itself is located uh basically northwest of cold lake uh towards ethel lake uh on the, um, the basically the primrose highway um we're 15 minutes away from cold lake about 20 25 minutes away from bonneville uh it's a really beautiful property we've got rolling hills we have a bunch of uh, uh treed uh, acres and, and things like that and uh, right now, our main production is pork. So we raise a type of pigs that's from New Zealand. Uh, and that is also part of the um, the ecological, the green aspect of the brewery is that the pigs can actually um, uh, be fed the spent grain uh, from the brewing process. Uh, we're, we're talking about a ton of grain uh, per, per, per brew day, right? So it's, um, it, it's, it's a sizable amount and it would be stupid to have it just be wasted uh, and the animals are able to process it. So that's that's a great way to do it. Um, other things we do at the farm, we do a lot of tourism uh, because our uh, our animals are cute. People like to see them. Uh, and we have a, a whole glamping setup uh, where we basically uh, we have a series of tents. Now we're developing domes where people come stay with us, eat at our table, uh, taste the product of the farm. Uh, we tell them how we do things here and, 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 and so on. So it's been really, really popular. Well, the farm itself sounds absolutely amazing. And with the popularity of local breweries rising over the years, I think this brewery will be a great addition to the farm. So thank you so much for joining me today. And I can't wait for this brewery to be open. Sure. Thanks a lot. That's all we have for news. Sports is next. But first, here's a look at your closing market.
Today's oil prices are brought to you by First General Services. hockey was announced over the weekend that could possibly change the landscape of junior hockey in Alberta forever. The Spruce Grove Saints, Sherwood Park Crusaders, Okotoks Oilers, Blackbolds Bulldogs and the Brooks Bandits are joining the British Columbia Hockey League for the 2024-25 season and leaving the Alberta Junior Hockey League. The AJHL responded with a news release saying they are addressing the next steps and schedule implications. The league also cancelled four games over the weekend that involved any of the five teams against any of the remaining AJHL teams. No release has come from any of the teams leaving the AJHL. PTLN did reach out to the Lloydminster Bobcats, but they had no comment at this time. A Saskatchewan staple, the rural farm. And in this next story, it's a little smaller than most. But as CTV's Noah Rashog tells us, it's got a big dream. This farm looks like any other out here in Saskatchewan, except it's 10,000 times smaller. We've got a guy cleaning up in, inside the barn there. This miniature model, one of many showcases, using toys to create dioramas and displays. Farm toys of all sizes. There's some die cast models, there's Hot Wheels, there's antique toys, vintage toys. Uh, there's even some old mechanical robot type stuff, so there's a little bit of everything. They are yeah. still toys, but I would re be reluctant to play with them. Neil Isley is running the show with his wife, showing off his own collection of old toy cars from the 50s, what he says was his introduction to the collecting community. At my grandma's, there's an old Massey 44 tractor, and I found out later on when, of course, as I got older, I said, Grandma, we need to fix this up. Came here for parts back in, uh, in the, in the mid-90s and got parts, met some of the, the vendors at the time, and now I know them all quite well. So. He's even helped his son to create a diorama depicting a scene from Cars 3. For the grass part we used, we painted down first and then we put like just spreaded grass on yep, it. Yep, model train grass. Many of these displays are expertly handcrafted. What, what this fella has done is he has built a toy that looks factory but a factory never made. The show is a must attend for collectors across Saskatchewan. Today is its final day. Noah Rashog, CTV News, Saskatoon.